I'd say on that. Um, so now I'm in a, the entertainment of the day. <laughs> we'll begin. And I'm, I'm delighted that Chris has agreed to talk to us about uh, Ronnie Biggs. Um, I um, actually first went to Brazil in um, 1974. Uh, my father uh, uh, took the whole family on a trip around the world, and I've just noted, I was looking in my diaries, and uh, in March 1974, we were staying in the Hotel Trocadero. Oh, my! Uh, <laughs> where I think, according to your excellent timeline in your book, Chris, uh, literally two months before, um, um, Biggs and, uh, had been uh, app apprehended. Um, uh, so, so that was that was an interesting link. Um, but Chris and I go back a long way. We've both been very much involved. We're both past chairman of the Latin American Travel Association. Uh, Chris has a deep love for Latin America, as I do. Uh, we've both lived in Brazil, um, and uh, we've both been involved in the in the Latin American Travel Association's foundation, uh, which which we we we've enjoyed very much. Um, Chris was also briefly director of tourism uh, for St. Helena. Uh, I don't know whether that makes a link. I've been talking about Napoleon on some of my previous talks. Uh, there's another interesting link um, where you had a few problems with the runway there. Um, yep. but, <laughs> and his most recent post is as chair of the Anglo-Brazilian Society. So I think as you can tell, uh, Chris is uh, deeply uh, involved in Latin America and in Brazil in particular. And so, Chris, thank you very much for talking to us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, you're welcome. Right, so I do a share your, screen, share don't I? Let's see if it, that's... Okay. Does that come up? Perfect. That's great. Yes. And now I'm going to shut up and hand over to you. And, oh, sorry, before we start, <laughs> can I just say, if anyone's got questions for Chris, please just type them into the chat and then I'll gather them all together afterwards. Thanks, Chris. So, and ask anything you like. I, I will not be offended, whatever your view of Ron is or the train robbery or whatever. I'm obviously going to take you on quite a rapid tour of Ron's travels, as you'll see um, over the 13,000 days, which is about 30, 36 years he was on the run. He covered, to my estimation, about 53,000 miles. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't ring Ed up and uh, La Frontiers and book all his travels with them. So I'll explain a little about how he did move around in all that time. Um, and so let's go on our travels. That that actually that illustration was from the first and this is the ghost story you're getting because I'm Ron's ghost of course um, and also a very good friend of his I was um, this was from the first version of his autobiography we did that gives you a rough idea of some of the travels we'll be covering of how he went from London to Belgium to Paris then on to Australia and then from Australia how he got round into South well Latin America and down flying down into Rio uh, what this one doesn't show of course is his trip back to um uh, Britain at the, the end when he came back. Um, these slides will just give you random photos of various things. That's a bit to show sort of we, we were slightly known as the odd couple because people never expect me to be the ghost of Ron or to be his good friend. It's actually worked quite well for me in uh, interview situations where the people don't ask the right questions because they assume I don't have the answer. Uh, so little do they know. So I did two versions of Ron's um, autobiography. We did his original one back in 94. And then once we got him out of prison, he wanted to do the definitive one covering his return and everything in prison. And uh, that was the last one we did, Odd Man Out, The Last Straw. Uh, we also wrote a novel together, which was great fun, called Keep On Running. I can now tell you that I wanted to call it Tom, Dick and Harry, and I wasn't allowed to because two of the names were right. It was about the three people that got away that were never captured from the drain robbery. Um, also did a book, book a zine with him on the 50th anniversary of the train robbery, which was also the time when he actually, um, uh, the same year he sadly died. Um, I think when you look at Ron, one of the things to remember in everything I'm telling you is that at this stage, Ron had never travelled abroad. I mean, if you go back to 63, most of the British public hadn't travelled abroad. So Ron did all this travelling with no passport, no documents. The only time he ever actually travelled on a passport in his name 
was the passport that he got to come back to Britain um, in, in 2001. Um, I was actually there when he, when he had to sign it. And we had to get special permission from the British government for it to be issued by the consul in Rio for him to come back. Anyway, you'll probably know that he, he, he sort of got his fame or infamy from his part in the great train robbery. Now, you'll notice that his biography is odd man out because he very much was the odd man out. Um, the train robbery involved two gangs because of the size of the, the crime. Uh, one was run by a man called Bruce Reynolds, who was also known as the Prince of Thieves. Um, he was very similar to a Cary Grant type figure. He was a very classy act as, as a robber. Um, very good at it. He used to do a lot of robberies in the south of France, but he was he was a professional crook. Uh, the other gang involved yes, was called the Southwest Raiders, and they South Coast Raiders, sorry, and they they were headed up by a man called Roger Cordry, and Bruce brought them in because they were experts in stopping trains. They had done quite a lot of success, bizarrely, I don't know why, on the London to Brighton um, uh, route. And it's because of their expertise on stopping trains that they were brought in. Ironically, the expertise just meant putting a battery on a light and turning it red. That's all the expertise you need. So they actually wouldn't have needed the other gang, but they did. Now, Ron was in neither gang. Ron was, Ron was only there because he was a friend of uh, Bruce's. And also, by pure coincidence, Rom had then gone straight. He was he had his own building company. Um, he um, was working on refitting the windows of a train driver who was about to retire. And the gang was looking for a backup train driver. And it was Ron's link to this train driver that got Ron on the job. I mean, he'd actually gone straight, but he was he admitted to me he had missed the excitement and everything. Um, as I say, Bruce was was very much a professional um criminal with his gang and so they would just go from job to job so the idea that some people have that the great train robbery was something special it wasn't it was just going to be another robbery now on a travel note it was it was um slightly funded by the um travel industry because the previous job in the november of 62 is bruce's gang held up london airport and stole the payroll of boac and that actually was the money that paid to set up the great train robbery. But it wasn't that that was the end thing. As far as Bruce was concerned, if they'd done the train robbery and actually if it hadn't had as much money as it did, they would have simply gone on to their next crime. They were as surprised as anybody that it had as much money on the train as it did. Um, the robbery actually took place not far from Ed. Um, it was it's on a, on the track that goes down. It was just south of Leighton Buzzard and slightly north of Tring. Um, and it was they looked it out. It was the perfect place to to stop a train. It was the train that used to come down every day from Glasgow to Houston. Um, stories that it was all there's a lot there's a lot of myths about the train robbery. A great one is that it was bringing Scottish notes down to be burnt in London because nobody trusted the Scots. Actually, most of the money went on the train in England. It was picking up money as it went down from the banks to go to the Bank of England. Um, now, there's another interesting point that, that Bruce told me. It sounds romantic, a train robbery. And the reason for this was after World War II, banks and especially their safes got a lot more secure. So it was much more difficult to rob a bank as they used to. So it changed the whole thing that what you came down to is you needed to get the money in transit if you wanted to rob it. It was much easier to do that. And that's why they were looking to rob security cars and things, but trains with this amount of money were fairly rare. And sadly, it's why we have cybercrime today, because still criminals are looking for, where do you find the money? It's not being moved around anymore. Money has become electronic, so you have to rob that. So I doubt there'll be any other great train robberies. Um, within days of uh the 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 robbery somebody did give the police and gave scotland yard a list of quite a lot of the people that were involved in the robbery uh ron's name wasn't on it because again he wasn't part of any of the gangs um and uh he was on uh, he was only visited by the police simply because they wanted to know if he'd seen bruce reynolds because they knew of his contact However, that time, then his fingerprints were found at the farm. So they went back and they arrested him. And that was the 4th of September. Um, just so you can keep in mind, the take from the robbery was uh, 2.6 million pounds, which if you convert it by today's value, we're talking that they got away with about 50 million pounds. 
So it's still up there amongst the biggest robberies of all time. And it's certainly still one of the most iconic. Uh, you'll see at the top of, of the top pictures, that's actually the light that they just simply changed from, they put a glove over the, the green and then used a battery to light the red. And that's what stopped the train. And then another thing people forget is how many people, why they had 16 of them at the track. It seems a lot when you've only got a driver and a few postal men in the back. In fact, there were 76 people on the train because the train was the mail train. So all the back part of it had all these sorters. So when they planned the robbery, they had to do it as working from the, 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 the engine backwards and then uncoupling where all these people were. Um, and the idea then was if, if they were alerted and came out, you all ran for it. But it didn't happen that way. They just kept on. They were used to the train stopping and didn't spot that it had stopped. Of course, in those times, no mobile phones, nothing like that. So anyway, slowly, everybody was, uh, well, quite a few of them were rounded up. In fact, when the government decided to go to court and have the court case, only nine of the 16 people at the track were in custody, but they didn't want the public to know that. They were trying to make out that they got everybody and they were prosecuting everybody. Uh, the trial went uh, started on the uh, 20th of January, 1964 and ran through until the April, uh, 16th of April was when sentencing was done. Again, Robin, Ron was the odd man out uh, because he got away with a mistrial after a policeman had let slip that he had been in prison with, um, with Bruce. And of course, you're not allowed to let a, a jury know that. Uh, the trial was actually also close to where Ed is. It was in Aylesbury. And they put it in Aylesbury because they were convinced these guys would, uh, the guys involved with the train robbery would know how to nobble a jury if it was at the Old Bailey. Um, and they're probably absolutely right on that. What's interesting was it actually worked the other way around, that the wives of the train robbers were being threatened by other gangsters. And then they had to bring in other people to threaten the people who were threatening the wives to clear it up. So it all got a bit messy. But anyway, when the uh, sentences came down, this was this thing that they were given 30 years, uh, which was the highest sentences ever given out in Britain, far more than murderers were getting, far more than spies were getting, child molesters were getting. And I think it's because of this, those sentences, and it was an unpopular government at the time, combined with the fact that basically they stole the government's money that's why people became on the side of the robbers and they got this Robin Hood um, image around them. I'm told, of course, I was far too young at the time to know this, that apparently if you were spending money at the time and you brought out a £10 note or something and it was unusual, pubs and restaurants and places were meant to call the police if they were suspicious of the money. That was that much money in circulation. Um, and in fact, if you go on in time, at one stage, Harold Wilson, and it's in the cabinet papers when he had taken over the government, he actually thought of changing the currency in Britain to try and get stop the, um, the money from the train robbery being in circulation. And the cabinet talked him out of it because it would have been crazy. It was only a tiny percentage of the British money that was involved. And to redo your entire currency uh, would be absolutely nuts. Um, after the, uh, the, the, they were all sentenced, they were allowed to have an appeal, which was held at the Old Bailey. And what was surprising was Charlie Wilson, who was one of the leaders who was in prison up in Birmingham, Birmingham, he decided not to appeal and nobody could work out why. And they should have done because Charlie worked out that when you were taken down to London, the chances are you get sent back to a different prison. And he'd already worked out how he was going to escape, so he didn't appeal. And he was quite right because Ron was moved from one prison and got put in Wandsworth. Um, uh, I should, I've now got a slight um, Duke of Edinburgh story for you here, because in the midst of all of this, once these people were got 30 years, Bruce Reynolds, who was never arrested, decided it was time to leave the country with his family. And Bruce traveled to Mexico. Um, he went there with, he flew Sabina, disguised, he, he had a fake passports and everything. And when he got to, um, Mexico. He was looking for a cover of who he was in Mexico. He had the fake name. And he discovered that um, the Dunhill representative, as in the lighters and all of those things, wasn't terribly good in Mexico. And he bought the Dunhill representation. And that was his cover when he was living in Mexico. And then suddenly along comes the Duke of Edinburgh on a visit. And the embassy sends Bruce an invitation to the cocktail party reception for the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, quite rightly, Bruce decided to make his excuses and not to go, considering the number of police and security people that would have been at the embassy. 
but the duke the duke missed his chance to meet the the, uh, the uh, bruce so he never met the prince of thieves um Ron had planned to actually, there was no uh, parole at the time of this, the, the robbery. So 30 years was looking like 30 years. Now we want to treat Wandsworth as almost his departure lounge on his travels. Um, and Ron didn't plan to escape, but after Charlie Wilson did, the way they were all treated, all the robbers, where they were watched 24 hours, lights were left on. He felt his life had become impossible in prison. He warned the, um, the governor that he was having a nervous breakdown and still wouldn't listen. But there was one man in prison with him, a man called Paul Seaborn, who was just a run of the mill crook, um, who was outraged by the sentence. And he said, Ron, it was Ron's honor to escape. He had to escape. And eventually after a bit of bullying, it was decided that they would try and escape. So Paul and Ron put together this scheme um, together. So when you see um, a, 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 a headline in that, how the snatch mob sprang bigs, uh, there was no mob, there was no nothing. It was just Ron and Paul had organized this. There was also a man called Eric Flower, who will come along in the travels now, who Ron knew, who was a much better connected crook who was inside. But because he was on appeal, he could speak to his lawyers every day. And that's how Paul had been uh, released from his sentence to set up the escape. And um, that's how they got the messages out through through Eric's uh, lawyer. Now, if you want to know the important thing of the escape, which they worked out was the only way out was from the exercise yard over the wall. Um, it was Ron's profession or expertise as a builder. They needed the height of the wall and Ron did it by counting the bricks in the wall. So when you're ever near a big wall, try walking around in a circle and count the bricks. It's not easy. And he has my absolute admiration of being able to work to the exact inch how high that wall was. And that's how they worked out that if you could, I mean, it does sound crazy that you could actually park a removal van next to the wall. We won't ask why. Um, and it had built in this trap door system in the roof where it would come up and um, it had a platform which would get to the height of the exact height of the wall where Paul threw over the rope ladders that Ron and Eric and some others who were very smart and as they saw Ron and Eric going up the rope ladders followed them over. So actually more people got out than were meant to. Um, interesting thing, you'll see sort of a brown book on the top line, that's his prison book, which I was lucky to have in my possession for a while. And what's wonderful is it actually has had the time he went to the yard and that's where it ends. And it, he was, because he was a special watch prisoner, every time he moved around the prison, his movements were, were, were jotted down. But um, for that one, they, they, they mixed up. There's a lovely one you'll see on, the, on, the, on, your, on your left, 150 police raid a mansion. No idea why, but somebody had it. I think his name was, he was Prince Carol of Romania. And nobody knows why. Somebody kept ringing Scotland Yard up and telling people that, they were, that Ron was in Prince Carol's properties. So they raided this one that was close to London. And he also had one down in Cornwall that was raided. And Ron never met the man in his life. And nobody to this day knows why somebody was obsessed with ringing up and saying that Prince Carol was hiding Ron. You'll also see the airport they hid in crates. So anyway, once Ron had escaped, he, he went into hiding. Um, first of all, with, with Paul, but Eric being much more professional said, they'll know it's, they will know it's Paul, they will come and get you. We need to be looked after professionally. And that's when Eric brought in uh, the criminals, uh, if you like, tour operator to sort out their, their, their travel plans. Uh, and this was part of the organization that would include the Craze and people like that and the Richardsons. This was a completely separate operation that helped people out with their travel plans when they needed them, if you shouldn't be on the radar, and also your travel documents, be it a fake passport or whatever. So they came round and they picked uh, Ron and Eric up and they put them in a series of safe houses, which included started in Putney, then they moved them to Richmond. Uh, and so Ron went through his own lockdown over three months. He couldn't really go out. Um, and towards the end, he was getting a bit fed up with it. And they actually stayed in Bognor Regis for a time. And that's when his wife, Charmin, could join them for a while. And so all during this time, they had discussions of where they were going to go. Um, and they came up with the idea that Australia looked the best bet to go for. Um, but the, it was also recommended that perhaps Ron should have plastic surgery, which was very new in 1964. Um, and that could be done in Paris. So this was all done part of the package and Ron paid for it all with his train robbery money and also paid for Eric's um, uh, to be part of it as well. So the first step was getting them out of Britain and that travel was arranged by moving them back from Bognor to London. 
And then they sneaked Ron and Eric onto a cargo ship, a small one in the London docks. And they were hidden amongst um, a lot of packages at the front of the bow of the ship. And they were basically told, look, once you, once you feel that the ship stopped, wait a while and then just leave the ship and walk to the dock gates. And Ron was thinking, this is, you're not getting a lot of, for your bucks on this money, that that's all you're told to do. And they said, trust us. And they, you know, these guys knew who you paid off. So they did, they, they hid, they, they could sense the ship had moved away from, from London and had gone off down the Thames. Uh, and, and it got to, they, they got to Antwerp and they waited a while and they realized everything was quiet. And sure enough, they moved the bags that were hiding them and they went out onto the docks. There was nobody around, nobody to talk to them. Um, Ron said, as they walked towards the gates of the docks, they were expecting at any time to be grabbed by somebody, but no, nothing. As soon as they walked out the dock gates, and again, remember, we don't have mobile phones or anything in those days, two cars appeared. Eric what got in one car, Ron got in the other, and they drove towards Paris. And the coverage of crossing from, from Belgium into France was quite simple. The car Eric was in had a lady with a very short skirt and long legs, who distracted the passport control um, of the at the French border, um, and Ron was in a car with a family with kids around him. And again, when they were across the border, there was just conversation. Ron at this stage had the passport that you see down at the bottom right uh, of his uh, as Terence Ferminger. Ferminger. Um, this was a real person, and uh, just like you you read in the spy things, they had found a man. They had paid him for a passport using his name, he never intended to travel. So it was a genuine British passport and there was nothing false about it. It just happened to be Ron's new photo in it, which doesn't look anything particularly like Ron. Um, in Paris, uh, he and Eric went under um, a plastic surgery. I think Eric just had a nose job. Ron had a full facelift, which he said was incredibly painful. Um, it, it's, um, it, it's interesting to say, because plastic surgery was at a very early time. Later on, Ron worked out that all these guys who were doing the plastic surgery in Paris were actually the ones who'd done all the plastic surgery on the escaping Nazis. And they had then moved to Paris. And they were actually the ones doing it on people, all the Hollywood stars as well. They were the best people. But nobody asked where they'd learnt their training and stuff. But they were all based in and around Paris. So um, Eric and, and uh, uh, Ron were in uh, Paris from October 65 onwards. And then at the end of 1965, they decided the time was right to move on to Australia. Uh, Ron's um, wounds were starting to heal. Uh, for the rest of the life, his, he still had scars behind his ears and he had to be quite careful. Um, in those early parts, he grew sideburns down to cover. And at some stage he had to tell people who did notice them that he had brain surgery or something to take them off the, the hint of what was going on. So anyway, they planned how to get uh, uh, Eric and um, Ron to, uh, to Australia. And um, Eric was used as the first trial to do the route first to see if it all worked smoothly because he was the least under the, you know, he wasn't one of the world's most wanted men while Ron was on every Interpol list as one of the 10 most wanted men in the world at this stage. So he went first. Now, what's, what's interesting when we look back at our travels, of course, in the 60s, planes didn't go as far. So even the BOAC flight to Australia stopped in many places. And its first stop after London was Zurich. So what they did was they planned Ron's route to take him from Paris. They, he, he joined, a, he spent the Christmas with Charmin and the children. They were brought over and smuggled over to Paris to spend that Christmas with him. And he then, on the 30th of December of 65, um, he, he set off going Paris to Zurich and then joined the BOAC flight down to Sydney. And it would stop at various places like Singapore and keep going. Now, one of the th thinking of the organizers for that was he was less suspicious getting off a British flight in Sydney amongst another bunch of Brits. If you are the only Brit passport holder on another flight, it might be suspicious. So the people in Australia never worked out that he actually got on, on Zurich, Zurich. All they saw was he was a man getting off the BOAC flight. Um, he was nearly caught when he arrived in Sydney because of his shoes. Um, Charmin had bought him for Christmas present a pair of crocodile shoes in Paris, which was terribly trendy. Now, Ron, never having flown, didn't realise what happens to your feet when you go long haul and they swell a bit. So his feet had swollen in these crocodile shoes and he was like tiptoeing through the airport at Sydney 
when the people called him over and he thought he was going to be nicked then and there. And it was all about that uh, crocodile shoes, crocodile products were on a banned list of stuff you could import into Australia. So Ron said he's never been so relieved to take off his shoes and give them to the uh, customs official and put on a pair of hush puppies, I think he did. So he arrived actually in Sydney on New Year's Eve. So we're going into 66 now. Um, and yes, I, I don't, you don't notice these things, but in 1966, they were building the Sydney Opera House that we all take for granted. So that's actually what it would have looked like when he arrived uh, down under, so to speak. Ron took to Australia very well. He and Eric settled down very well. Uh, in the 60s, Australia wasn't particularly fussy about who you were and what your papers were, so they could find work very easily. Um, it would interest you to know that how, how in those days don't you bring suspicion up when you're sending money and what Charmian would do was she would put you would put the the notes the actual 10 pound or 20 pound notes in magazines and then stick the pages together and then send them through the post so that's how you did it you you glue them very carefully in the middle bit you get a nice thick magazine send it off through the post and, and actually Ron was using the address of a taxi driver in Sydney he had met who didn't mind getting the mail Ron made some excuse why he couldn't uh, receive it um, however the taxi driver got a phone call one day from the police saying could you explain why you've got these magazines full of money um, and Ron decided it was probably best to leave Sydney in that case uh, so he and uh, Eric decided to move on to Adelaide, and this would be a continuing thing in Australia that as he was tipped off that somebody might be getting close to where he was, he would have to move on, which was, which was, you know, quite disruptive because he was trying to set up a home. At one stage, he actually owned a, a share in, in a, um, a, a beach house boarding place in, in Adelaide that he was setting up and was going very well. But again, once he was in Adelaide, there were, there were tip offs that he might be there and he had to move again. Uh, just as Eric had come out as a trial, Eric's family came out as a trial to see if anyone was following them and Eric's wife and children arrived safely. So it was then just thought that Charmian could come out and join Ron with the two sons. Uh, they decided uh, to bring them in via Darwin so they'd be as far away as possible if anybody was following them. Uh, so it was agreed that Ron would go up to Darwin and meet Charmian as she arrived with the children. Uh, now, here's the lesson of why you do need a tour operator, because Ron looked in, had looked in papers and he'd seen a picture of a motel in, in, in uh, Darwin that looked very nice. It was, it was a drawing of this motel, so he chose that's where he would meet uh, Charmian, and that's where he said, you know, come out the airport and go to this motel, and that's where we'll meet. The only problem was the motel had never been built yet. So that's why you use a tour operator, you see? Um, anyway, Ron gets up there and there's quite a bit of confusion because Charmian arrives, of course, is talking to people from the airline saying, I need to go to this motel, which doesn't exist. So they very kindly, because there was a lot of conferences going on in Darwin, do a quick ring round to find places where they can get her a room for the kids, which they did. Ron, who was watching through a window, was convinced she'd been uh, arrested because they had a code that if they didn't recognize each other in the street or anything, it meant don't make contact because we're being watched. She, he didn't realize the light on the window as such was she never saw him through the window. So that could have caused a lot of confusion. Anyway, she was taken to a motel. He was convinced that she had been arrested, but he contacted the airline who weren't so officious as some of the airlines today about information. And they were happy to say that this lady, that was fine. She'd arrived, there'd been a mix up of the hotel where she was staying. So Ron went to the, hotel, the new motel and Ron had a second sense of where, who were policemen or not. And he said, as he was approaching this motel, he realized that just about everybody he was looking at was a policeman, an undercover cop. So he thought, well, this is a trap. I'm about to be nabbed. And he went in and he was surprised. He got as far as reception and asked for Charmian and nothing happened. And Charmian came down and nothing still happened. And it was then he looked at the board of the hotel and it turned out it was a conference of policemen were being held at that motel. So he, um, that was another lucky escape. Uh, they decided to have a big holiday um, and they chose to drive. They, they, they bought a car and they then drove down all doing the Gold Coast and everything you'd want to do. I mean, Ron had the train robbery money, so money wasn't a problem. So that's some of the pictures with Ron. That's the one on the left under the BOAC. Um, that's very rare family shot of him with the two sons 
on that trip down. Um, so that, that would have been one of the, you know, he obviously didn't take many photos of himself when he was on the run because of the the, the dangers of it all. That's their house. That they uh, When in Adelaide, they thought he was being, they, were, they, they had the tip off that somebody thought they were in Adelaide. They moved to Melbourne where they really set up and that was their house in Melbourne where they really did settle down. Uh, another twist of the story is that Ron then became quite successful, again, working for people as a builder and a carpenter. And he was working in a shopping centre when he looked down and he saw someone who looked terribly familiar. And it turned out to be a man called Michael Haynes, who was a great friend of his from England. Who, I mean, literally one of his best friends. And the guy didn't know Ron was in Brazil. Ron didn't know he was he'd come to sorry in Australia. He didn't know he'd come to he was coming to Australia. So they met up and it was a great reunion. So these were two great friends meeting up and they worked and they partied together. And everything looked very good for them in Australia. That had the third son, Farley. Um, and then what happened was Bruce Reynolds eventually was arrested back in Britain. He'd come back from Mexico because his wife, um, it's, I shouldn't say this either. Um, Bruce came back from Mexico because his wife couldn't cope with Mexico. She didn't really enjoy it. What he didn't know was she was a lady who suffered from terrible depression. And as he said, it wouldn't have mattered where we were. She wouldn't have been happy that people didn't appreciate the impact of depression in those days. So he said the whole thing coming back actually it didn't help coming back at all. And he originally moved to the south of France and then back to Britain where he was caught. And because he was caught, of course, all the news of the train robbery was all over the papers again. Um, and his wife, Frances Reynolds, sold a massive story which turned up in Australian's Women Weekly and included photos of Ron. So he was tipped off again that he, he, he people knew he was in Melbourne and they they, Ron literally saw himself on that evening's news, um, left the house that night, went to a motel close by. He was dropped off by Charmian. Um, in the morning, Charmian did a run to drop uh, to, to, I think she was just going picking up some bread and milk that she'd gone in the car. And on her way back, her car was surrounded by all the police, armed police, um, and she was arrested, but they never did find out what had happened to, to Ron. Ron had now gone into hiding. Um, and there you'll see that the, the men found the only his suitcases that he'd left in the in the motel. Um, but as soon as he was worried that 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 might even be traced. So uh, Charmian was arrested. Ron went and hid in various places. He had one friend that hid him in some in a house of a, a, a holiday house in the hills above Melbourne. And he spent time there. Uh, Ron said he'd have been caught. But one of the things he knew was that um, he says, and he, he said this right up until his death, he said the problem for the police is often their ego, and this isn't with a lot of things, but they love telling the public what they're doing. And as he said, if the man who was trying to catch him didn't keep going on television and radio and saying what he was about to do, Ron wouldn't know what he was going to do. So every time the man went on television and said, I'm about to search the mountains, Ron would move. And it, he never could understand why the public couldn't understand. If the police don't want to tell the public about something, there should be a very good reason. So anyway, he, he went into hiding and it wasn't very satisfactory. But what was interesting was none of the police had bothered to visit Mike Haynes. So they realized that Mike and his wife were not on the radar of the, 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 the police as a connection with Ron. So eventually they very kindly put Ron up and Ron went and moved into their house um, around, I think it was November 68. He was discovered there in the October. Uh, now, next to the Varig picture in the middle of your screen, if you could see it, the man sitting back in the chair is the real Michael Haynes. Um, and Ron at that stage thought he would just disappear into the middle of Australia and Charmian would continue living in Melbourne. And then one day Mike Haynes simply said, um, I'll lend you my passport. I'll give you my passport. He said, I don't plan to travel. Why don't you use my passport and go? So this opened up the world to Ron. So Ron sat about thinking where he would go. And they, he, Mike and his wife would sit around at night joking where to go. And Mike Haynes' wife would go off to travel agents and pick up brochures. And one night on the top of the brochure pile was a Varig uh, brochure with that photo of Rio on it. And uh, Ron thought, why not? Ron was a huge fan of, of Bossa Nova. Uh, didn't know much about Brazil. Did, certainly didn't know it didn't have any extradition, but thought it sounded romantic and nice. So they decided, fine. Brazil it is, but then you've got to work out how do you get from Brazil, uh, sorry, how you get from Australia uh, to Brazil. So they discovered the best way to do that um, would be by 
by ship to Central America and then pick up the flight there. So that's how they planned it. Um, I find it interesting, the, the, the shot of the man in the glasses and the short hair on the left, that, that is Ron's passport photo that went in Michael Haynes's passport. And it's one of the few photos I see of Ron where I can't see much about him. And he did that by just putting on weight and obviously the glasses and everything. So they booked him on the uh, MS Alinas, who used to do a regular run from Europe down to Australia and back again and it would sell, sail from Melbourne. And again, at different days of travel, it was so simple for them that the real Michael Haynes actually went through emigration with his passport. But in those days, ships encouraged you to bring guests on board uh, before the sailing. So Ron went up the gangplank with Mrs. Haynes and they went and met um, Mike on board. While my Ron was never a forger. I mean, Ron was never a very good crook either. And he'd be the first to admit that. While he was hiding in Mike's house, he had to work out how to forge putting the photo in Mike's passport. And in those days, it wasn't the plastic laminate you got. You had those sort of that those punched holes. So Ron had to methodically work on bits of cardboard, prodding it out so that it would match his photo with what was already on the passport. And he must have done a very good job because in all his travels, um, other than once in Argentina, it wasn't particularly noticed. So the first thing on getting on board the Alinas he did was he went quickly to his cabin to get sorted out where he was in those days, you shared cabins, so he was going to be with three other men sharing a cabin. He quickly went in, took uh, Mike's um, uh, picture out of the passport, uh, tore it up, flushed it down the toilet and put his one in with sort of crit stick and glue. He then went back on deck, had a quick drink with Mike Haynes and his wife, who very cleverly had booked tickets for the opera, I think it was that night in, in Melbourne, uh, where they were meeting Charmian. Uh, so they would all have an alibi and nobody would think anything of it. They went, um, Ron was on board now as Michael Haynes. The ship sailed from Melbourne. Now his first problem was its first port of call was Sydney. And of course, everybody on board's attitude was let's get off at Sydney and party for the day. So Ron had to pretend he had a stomach problem and was called a whinging pom and all those sorts of things because he wouldn't get off the ship saying, oh, I'm terrible. And so, because he thought, I don't want to go through customs again. Um, he did admit that once they got sailing again from Sydney and he said one of the, I mean, it, it is one of the most touching moments of his life that he said he, he really did shed a tear as they sailed out of Sydney and that part of his life was going. Um, but he soon got into shipboard life and um, the next port of call was actually New Zealand. And by that stage, he thought to hell with it. If I'm going to be captured, let's at least have fun. And he did get off in New Zealand. He did get off in Tahiti as it sailed across um, uh, the, the Pacific. Uh, a nice story about the leaders. I'm always finding things about Ron. And here's a wonderful bit of trivia for you that um, David Bowie actually wrote Aladdin Sane while sailing on the Alinas. Because David Bowie in the early days, he, he, he didn't like flying at all. And when he could go by ship, he would. And apparently in the, in the early 70s, he was on the Alinas going between, it was actually going between Boston and the UK. And if you get your Aladdin Sane albums out, you'll see that every track on the label has in brackets where he wrote it. And the actual track Aladdin Sane has brackets up um, MS Alinas. So there you go. M wonderful trivia for you. Images of the ship there and some of his, those were his cabin mates with a lady he had. Ron was quite a ladies man and it always annoyed Charmian that he was such a ladies man. He even had an affair on the ship while in that short time uh, going across to, to Panama. Uh, they left uh, Sydney, they sailed from Sydney on the 7th of February uh, of 60, uh, 60, 69. And they, and then it was, it went across to, and it took until the 23rd of February to reach Panama. Um, he nearly fell off the ship, and as he admits, he would have become a Lord Lucan because if he'd fallen off the ship, I mean, I have to say, he'd, he'd imbibed a little bit, and he thought it'd be hilariously funny to climb over the, the side of the ship and swing into the cabin through the porthole, but he nearly lost his footing. And he always looked back at it, and he said, if he'd fallen in the Pacific, he would have, I mean, we don't know, Lord Lucan may be sitting somewhere, we don't know, but he said, if he'd gone to the bottom of the Pacific, nobody, stories of who had spotted Ron would have gone on for years, and he'd have been at the bottom of the Pacific. So anyway, he greatly enjoyed the, 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 the cruise across, uh, went through the Panama Canal, arrived in Panama. He then had a slight problem. He was still waiting for some money and the Americans controlled uh, immigration at Panama at the time. And they wanted to deposit because he didn't yet have his, his airline ticket to go on from Panama. And it was almost the exact amount of money he had to give them 
for uh, as sort of as a bond that he needed to buy the ticket. And luckily, at the last moment, Charmian managed to wire money to the ship, so he did have enough. Uh, he was only stayed in Panama City a couple of days, and he bought a ticket then to throw people off the 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 in case anybody was following him and followed the passport. The ticket he bought was to go Panama, Caracas, Rio de Janeiro, Montevideo. So that if anybody looked at the ticket, they might assume that he'd gone all the way to Montevideo. On the ship, he met some very nice people who lived in Caracas, um, were very well connected in Venezuela. Um, and they had said to him, oh, don't just pass through, come and stay. And in fact, he spent a couple of weeks in Caracas. And later, that would be incredibly important for him never being sent back to Britain, because in going through Caracas, uh, Caracas or Venezuela on a false, false passport, it meant that he had committed a crime in Venezuela. And it meant he could never get sent back there, which became very important later on. Um, enjoyed his time. The people really enjoyed Ron. They offered him that they, in that wonderfully South American way, that they would get him papers and they could get him all his work stuff and they could come and join him. One of the people had a restaurant and they, he was going to go and join them in business there. Um, and he, he um, decided to pass on. So then he got on a plane and flew down to uh to Brazil, where he arrived on the 11th of March 1970 at the old Galleon airport. Um, he was, he, again, he was very lucky. He was chatting to an American on the plane who was actually somebody who would give him a lot of his contacts in Brazil, just a, a businessman who was flying down there, but gave Ron his first contacts of taking him to people. When he arrived in Rio, he, as he was talking to the man, he thought that's the best way to go through customs, just, just be casually talking to an American. And they actually went in behind a group of nuns, which there's nothing better if you're trying to get through an airport than follow a bunch your nuns you'll you'll get you'll be okay so he arrived in swinging rio in the 1970s it was a sort of a great city and you know very sexy and exciting it was still the bossa nova period uh tropicalismo was starting and so he started to settle in rio um and enjoying life in rio and getting to know people but was still very much away from his um uh family uh, and I don't know how many of you remember, but if you go back into the into those eras of the 1970s when we didn't have the Internet and we didn't have even faxes and things, one of the ways you could do your letters was to send them to the American Express office. And that's what Charmian did. It was just a general thing that was an agreement. You could have you just sent your mail to the American Express office. And if you turned up with proof of identity, your passport, um, they would give you the mail. So he had made that contact with the American Express office in Rio. Um, and again, it was um, a, a man who worked for the American Express, a Brazilian, who was one of his first great Brazilian contacts to take him to the music bars and places because he really enjoyed Ron's company. But he would go in and he would he would pick up mail for Mike Haynes as that's what was sent to him. Um, but the important thing on this is to remember that as glamorous as Brazil was, and also 70, of course, was the year of the Mexico World Cup, which Brazil won. So there were huge parties in Rio and, you know, a wonderful time. And Ron can remember. And that was the first televised World Cup as well. And so Ron can remember watching as an Englishman, watching the England-Brazil game, the famous one where with the bank save and all of that. And, and, then, and then cheering the rest of the tournament for Brazil and with his Brazilian friends. But he had a lot of fun with that. But what we also have to remember is in the 1970s, uh, Brazil was under a military regime, which was quite uh, tough um, to say the least and everybody needed identity papers and you had this huge police presence I mean Ron admits if he'd known what was going on he probably wouldn't have headed for Brazil because it wasn't a terribly sensible thing to do if you're a man on the run go to a military dictatorship but it meant his passport was key because it was the only document he had that proved he was Michael Haynes and it was again it was it was a real passport so nobody could say anything about that but he needed to keep it up to date. And as many of us who have traveled in Latin America or in the youth has done, you know, if you don't have the right papers, you just go across the border and then come back in and your, your, your visa's extended for another six months or something. So that's in the end what Ron decided he needed to do. And the first one he did was in September 70. So he'd just been in Brazil for six months and he was talked into going down to Buenos Aires. So he did the bus ride down from Rio. Uh, one of the things he thought was avoid airports and planes because they were much more, they were, they were much more into what your document said. And he felt this might go on a database and somebody might spot Michael Haynes moving around while a bus nobody gives cares less. And that was the reason he took these trips. And he also wanted to see the countryside and learn more about it. This was a man who was exploring the world. As I said, he never, he'd never traveled before. 
So he took the bus. So that was, I mean, these bus rides that he took were about 24 hours and they still are today because the speed of a bus hasn't changed that much. And it was actually Rio down to Port Alegre, which he said was awful because the bus was absolutely packed and he had a huge lady next to him and there was no room to sleep or anything. And then it skidded off the road into some mud. And that's where he learned that you all got out and tried to push the bus out of the mud. And the Brazilians knew where to push the bus. They let Ron push it where, when the wheel turned, he got covered in mud. So he had to take the rest of the journey, which is not a good start look when you're trying to cross a border incognito. Um, in Porto Alegre, it was a different bus that took them down to the, the um, border with Argentina. Um, he was very happy that leaving the Brazil side, nobody really cared much. They looked at the passports because the driver just got them all together. Guy looked at them, that was fine. He thought, well, this is easy. Get to the Argentine side. It's everybody off, everybody. And it was about four or five in the morning. Everybody in a brightly lit room, those dreadful strip lighting things. You'd go up and there'd be a military guy. And this one guy just did not like Ron's passport. And he really thought that was it. And he said it was even the thing with the man with the knife under the photo looking at it. And eventually he stamped it and allowed him in. And he said he was never been so relieved. As he said, he, he had to find a toilet very quickly after that as he got through. Then he went on and enjoyed Buenos Aires. Uh, in true fashion, Ron was, was checking the sights of Buenos Aires when he was down there. He was walking around that area, which Ed will know well, where they have Harrods or the old Harrods used to be, where the shops, the main shopping area of, of Buenos Aires. And as he's wandering along the streets, he recognises a lady who's coming the other way. And it's Sarah Vaughan, who happens to be performing. In, in Buenos Aires. And, and Ron was a huge jazz fan, a real understanding for, for, for jazz. And he couldn't resist. I mean, he went and chatted to her and they had a very nice conversation. And he then got her, which I'm sure is totally illegal, he got her to put her autograph in the only thing he had, which was the passport. So Mike Haynes's passport ended up with Sarah Vaughan's signature in it, or autograph in it. Um, the return journey were, was, was less dramatic. Um, he got back to Rio. Then, sadly, at the start of 71, there's the very bad news that his, his eldest son, Nick, is killed in a car crash just after the holidays in Australia. Um, Charmin was driving. They were do, 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 It was a car ran, a, ran across a crossing. Um, it was Charmin's right away, hit the side of the car where the poor kid was. I mean, all the children, all three children were in the car, but uh, Nicky was almost killed immediately. And that was very tragic. Uh, and it was terribly tough for Charmian because the authorities were convinced that if Ron was in Australia, he would now put in an appearance. So everything from the funeral and everything became an absolute media circus. What nobody realised was Ron was, of course, in Rio de Janeiro. And to be quite frank, the Brazilians had no idea who Ronnie Biggs was. They weren't that bothered. So a story about this guy's son being killed in Australia never made the Brazilian news news. So Ron never learned about his son's death until well into February, a month later when the letters arrived. And he nearly gave himself up then. He was going to pan himself in. And then he thought this is not going to help anybody. So he stayed on in Rio. And, and then it was he thought, well, if he had to get back to Australia, the, the he still needed the passport to be valid. So he needed to take a second um, bus journey. And he decided that the best way to do this one would be um, he would try Bolivia um, after his experiences in Argentina. And he got on a bus that would take him from Rio down to Sao Paulo and across the whole centre of Brazil to Corumbá on the Bolivian border, where you were meant to then cross to Puerto Suarez. Um, what he discovered on that route was, again, the military would stop the bus every so often to look for communists on board. I mean, how you tell a communist is sitting on a bus, I have no idea, but they would do that. And then there'd be other police that would stop the bus and want to search everything. And it was only when Ron got to Corumbá that he realised when he was talking to the um, guy at the border that, in fact, that was one of the biggest drug runs in South America. It was where all the cocaine went backwards and forwards. And that's what the police were doing. So Ron, again, trying to be discreet, happened to have picked a very bad route. It's uh, not the one you want to you go on if you're doing that sort of thing. So he had to cross into to uh, Puerto Suarez on the Bolivian side. He said the Brazilian guy was very helpful again, said, look, a lot of you, you people do this. You go and come back on the same day. It doesn't look good. He said, spend a couple of nights there and then come back. Once he got to Puerto Suarez, he realised there, there was a bit of a racket going on with the senior policeman who knew exactly what tourists were doing. So he was running a black market to give you the right rubber stamp to let you say you've been in Bolivia to go back. And Ron had to persuade him that he didn't have enough money to pay his 100 and something odd dollars the man wanted for the stamp. And eventually he took what little money Ron had and then said, I like you and handed it back and stamped his passport. But the man had no idea. He said, he said, to, he said to Ron something like that. 
you're an interesting man. There's something very special about you. He said, I don't know what it is, but I feel I'm going to know about you some more. And then stamped his passport, which allowed Ron to get back into Brazil. We now go through a period where Ron basically settled in Brazil. He got to know, I mean, he still, he was with lots of women, got to know Ramunda, um, who would be the mother of his, his Brazilian child. Um, he settled down. He was doing very well as a carpenter. Um, all of all, a lot of the people I know in the, the foreign community in in, Brazil, in Rio used his services as a carpenter and a builder. Again, everybody just knew him as Mike Mike Haynes. Nobody suspected who he was. But the letters he was getting from Charmian, he realised something needed to change, and he couldn't see how he would survive and what he would do. So that's when, and it's very important to Biggs's story. Ron then decided he was going to return to Britain. He was going to give himself in. He was going to go back on a plane. And that's what he put in, in, in into action by getting a friend to go who was going back to Britain to start making um, uh, connections with people to see if somebody, if a newspaper would pay for his story. And he would then go back and some of that money could go to Charmian and he would take his chances. A parole system had come in, so he thought he might not have to serve 30 years. But it was very important to him that he was going to go back because a judge or whatever may take this into account when parole came about. Uh, so uh, this, this British man who went back, he made contact with the Daily Express, a very well-known journalist called Colin McKenzie, who, who writes a lot about horse racing and things now, Ed and myself were talking about him earlier. Um, so Colin had to, first of all, there'd been a lot of false, there was stories of the Hitler's diary and God knows what, a lot of forgeries. So first of all, Colin needed persuading that this man in Brazil really was Ronnie Biggs. So he sent him actually some fingerprints and stuff so that Colin could believe it. The Express wanted the story. Everything was agreed. Um, and so this would be early January uh, 1974. Um, those photos actually at the top are photos the Express took. Um, Raimunda never appeared in the photos, interestingly enough. Um, Ron got another lady he knew very well that the Express appreciated was quite photogenic. And these were all shot in the rooms of the Hotel Trocadero. Um, what Ron didn't know was that the, the editors of the Express decided they couldn't take the risk and had told Scotland Yard. So there is, it's important in all this that Scotland Yard had no idea where Ron was. They certainly didn't think he was in Brazil. They certainly didn't think he was in South America. So it was not the genius of the police tracking Ronnie Biggs down to, to Brazil, as you often read in stories. It was the Daily Express ringing them and saying, we, we've got a story, we're bringing him back. The Express very much wanted to bring him back in the sense of just get on the plane, we'll turn up at Heathrow Airport, this will be a fantastic story. Um, the police saw it otherwise. So um, Colin actually thought that Slipper, Jack, the famous Jack Slipper, would follow quite a few days after him and didn't. He, he followed almost immediately that Colin got there. So Colin didn't have many days with Ron talking to him and doing the interviews before the arrest happened. And it was at the Hotel Trocadero, Ron was in the room, knock at the door, and it was Slipper with another British policeman and some Brazilian police. But the, but the interesting thing was, Slipper and Scotland Yard had never informed the Brazilian authorities, whether they didn't trust them. And if you think the other way around, if a bunch of Brazilian policemen turned up in London and started arresting Brazilians without telling Scotland Yard, they wouldn't be very happy. And so that annoyed the Brazilian authorities greatly. Um, so Ron famously was arrested and he complained the fact, he explained to Slipper that um, he, he'd been very happy to get on the plane and go back, but he wanted it to be told that way. He quickly learned that this was not the story they wanted to tell. They wanted to tell um, the story that they'd found him there. Um, interestingly, when you look at the Brazilian papers, the following day of his arrest, it was only partly the lead story because in, tragically in Sao Paulo, the same day he was arrested, there was a massive fire, uh, the Joelma fire of where 173 people died. Um, and that's why that was a major story around the world. But all the British press then fled into Rio to because Ronnie Biggs was now discovered after all these years. So we're 1974. Um, Ron is arrested, but we then go through the thing. He discovers that Raymond is pregnant. He is outraged because of the, the deceit of the Express about him going back and how they're painting it. So once he discovers that he can stay in, in Brazil, he thinks, well, well, let's see what happens. Um, and he was then, uh, Jack Slipper was sent back famously without him. 
And there's a famous photo of Jack Slipper on the plane with an empty seat next to him, which all the press made out was that was Ron's seat that was never used. And in fact, it was a trick of the photographers on the plane because it was the other policeman was sitting in that seat and had gone to the toilet and it just gave a great photo sh shot. Um, so Ron was then sent up and more of his travels here. He gets sent to Brasilia because there's a special prison up there. Uh, where they keep uh, foreign prisoners. So he was flown up commercial flight with, with the various Brazilians guarding him. They realized he wasn't a threat to anybody. They all liked him and they thought he was a very sort of fun guy and was, you know, could speak to them in Portuguese and things. So he, he was moved up to the prison there. Uh, the photos you'll see is Charmian. Uh, Rupert Murdoch played a big part in uh, Ron's life. It was Rupert Murdoch who paid for, for Charmian's story when Ron was discovered in Australia and then kept tabs of her ever since. So as soon as Ron was discovered in Brazil, they were very keen to pay for her to go and see him in Brasilia and paid for all the money for her to go. Um, and that's how she ended up there. And um, nice story, uh, Ron had a, a, a cellmate next to him in the special prison in, in Brasilia, who's a man called Fernand Legro, who's one of the France's greatest forgers of paintings. Well, actually he was the agent for it. He sold them. He was, he was a multi, multi-millionaire. He was one of the richest men in the world, but the Swiss and the French have been after him for years. He'd actually been tracked to Geneva where he, he, he boasted whatever, whatever Cadillac he had, there were only two in the world. He had one and the US president had the other. Um, but this man had so much money, he'd bribed everybody in the prison in Brasilia. So, Ron was amazed that his prison cell had carpets, a color TV, lights, stereo unit. And then each night he would put, send to Ron's cell the menus from all the best restaurants in Brasilia. And Ron could choose what he'd like to eat and the restaurants would deliver it to the prison for them. So Ron was quite upset when Fernand finally got sent back to, to France. He actually never served any time in France because his lawyers argued the time he'd been in Brazil, Brazil was enough that it didn't count. And he ended up being the godfather to Mike, actually, um, later on in the story. So um, it's where Venezuela comes back into the story now is Ron, because of the money that Charmian had, they got a very good lawyer who actually ended up one of the Supreme Court justices in Brazil later in his career. And he managed to make a, uh, um, a how, do, how you turn defeat into victory. And what it was, it was very clever that um, this 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 lawyer managed to get the Brazilians to say that Ron couldn't be deported, but he could be extradited. And the difference in that is extradited, you just kicked out the country and they don't care where you go. Deported is they actually send you back to where it is to the authorities. So they agreed he could be extradited, not deported. And that included you could not extradite him to a country that had a deportation agreement with the UK. And there weren't many of those. One of them that didn't was Venezuela, but the Venezuelan government made it clear that because he made the crime of coming in without a proper passport, they would lock him up. So it was the equivalent of being deported. So that ruled out uh, Venezuela. Strange enough, Costa Rica was another one he could have gone to, but the Costa Ricans, apparently at that time, I didn't know, were getting a reputation for hiding people. So he, the, the Costa Rica was out. Now we have a new, I've, I'm sorry, the time, I'm go go quickly. Um, Ron then moved out to Sepetiba, which is just outside Rio. This was once he'd been once he'd been released on this thing that they couldn't extradite him, couldn't deport him. He was sort of caught in a limbo in Brazil. So he was taken back to Rio and released. And always he was like, well, when we find a country, we'll extradite you. But everybody they said to him, it's never going to happen. So don't worry about it. It's irrelevant. Um, so by January 75, he moved out of Rio to this fishing village because he didn't have much money. It was cheaper. He thought to bring up his son, who had now been born Mike, um, call, call Mike because of Mike Haynes' generosity with the passport. Running that by now, sent that passport back to Mike in Australia. In Sepetiba, Pierce Paul Reed turned up to tell him that would he agree to what the other train robbers had written in their story about the, the robbery, which was a load of rubbish because it included the fact that a bunch of Nazis had, were behind the great train robbery, which they didn't have. In fact, Buster Edwards did know this, um, this SS general uh, who was a criminal and got involved in various criminal activities later. But he had nothing to do with the great train robbery, but it was a great story to sell the publishers. It was during Sebetiba when he was living there that Ron learned he could sell um, stories to journalists for small sums of money. He next very much hit the British headlines because he still had to go in, despite Sebetiba being an hour or so out of Rio by bus and things, he had to come in twice a week to sign in with the federal police. And that was in Plaza Mawai in central Rio. 
And one time, which is right by the docks, and one time he was signing in, he was walking back to, to head back and get the bus. When he realized there was a bunch of British Navy guys in the square, all getting into trouble, trying to buy postcards and not being able to spend port, speak Portuguese. So Ron helped them, came across and explained what the shopkeeper was saying. And they, of course, all looked at him and said, you're Ronnie Biggs, aren't you? And he said, yes, I'm Ronnie Biggs. And they said, oh, you've got to come back on the ship and have a beer. And Ron didn't really think about the implications of this. And they went back to the HMS Dané that was, there was a whole fleet in town where there was a huge party took place until it was pointed out that actually Ron was sitting on British sovereign territory being a wrong naval ship. And lots of conversations went on with the captain of the ship and everything. And they realized this could have become a major diplomatic row with the Brazilians. So it was, you know, it was basically, it went down to the, down to the ward and said, get the, get him off the ship. And one guy tried to do a, a, a citizen's arrest, but they managed to get him out of the way and they got Ron off the ship. And as you can imagine, the, the ratings got into a bit of trouble for that, but it put Ron very much back in the, in the spotlight. Ron then goes back to Sebati, but the next people to turn up on his doorstep is Malcolm McLaren and two of the Sex Pistols. Um, and Ron found himself having an extraordinary uh, period with them of recording, of, which turned out to be the great rock and roll swindle film. Uh, they recorded several songs, which Ron wrote the lyrics to, the most famous one being No One Is Innocent. Ron wasn't a bad singer, especially when it comes to punk rock. And he was a very good writer. So his lyrics are really very clever and very good. Um, what annoys Johnny Rotten, who wasn't didn't go to Brazil with the rest of the Sex Pistols, is No One in, Is Innocent is actually the biggest selling Sex Pistols single of all time. It outsold the other ones. They had their album sales. So Ron is actually the vocalist on the top selling um, Sex Pistols single of all time. They were also there during Carnival and that Carnival of uh, 78. Also, for some reason, Rod Stewart and Elton John turned up. And what also turned up was a film crew, uh, which was a second unit from... Um, a James Bond production that wanted to shoot that carnival. So they were also in town. So that moves us a little bit further on where, where, where Roger Moore eventually turns up. And in fact, they were then starting to shoot Moonraker proper in Brazil. If you remember it, it was started in Venice, then they go on to Brazil. Um, and so there was great excitement in Rio that we had James Bond being shot there. Um, and everything like that. So Bond was there, as you see Bond arriving on Air France Concorde, because of course uh, the British Airways one, I think at that time was going to Dubai and not down the French had got the rights to fly Concorde to Rio. So that was all staged for Bond arriving. Um, they were also shooting in Fosdrig or Sioux and other places. So there was Bond going. And then somebody else turns up on Ron's doorstep down in Sepetiba which is a group of guys that claim that they're another second unit uh, film crew from Moonraker and the bomb thing. And they've been speaking to the director and it would have seemed quite reasonable. They thought it'd be fantastic to have a cameo role for Ronnie in a James Bond film. But Ron thought something was wrong. It just didn't tie up. And because they persuaded him, they were filming in uh, down in Fosdu Guasu. And it was, they said they had a private plane standing by and they would fly him down there and he could do his shots with Roger Moore and they could do it all and then they could continue on their, their happy way. Um, but it just didn't add up. In fact, what they were going to do is if they got him in the plane, they would have flown him up to Belém, the north of Brazil, where they had a yacht waiting, where they were going to take him out of Brazilian waters. These were the kidnappers and this was their first attempt to kidnap him. Luckily, somebody was already talking about the story back in Britain and a couple of friendly um, uh, journalists in Britain got in contact with Ron and said, we, we're getting a lot of rumors and stories that you've been contact, you've been, uh, you've been uh, kidnapped. And they said, as we're talking to you, obviously you haven't been, but is there anything that's happening that makes you think you're in danger? And of course, Ron put two and two together and realized these guys had nothing to do with the films, that they were actually kidnappers. Um, so Ron went and paid one of his visits and they were staying in the Copacabana Palace. It wasn't in the days that uh, it is now as glorious with the Belmond Group and Orient Express. It was still owned by the Ginley family, but it was still Rio's best hotel. And these guys were staying there. So it did sort of turn on, that's where Roger Moore had stayed. So it all sort of did tie up. But anyway, Ron went, when he was in the federal police, he told them he thought he was being kidnapped. The federal police rounded up these guys at the cop palace and in fact they discovered two of them were standing outside the police building waiting for Ron to come up because their timetable was they needed to grab him. Um, they were all kicked out of Brazil but unfortunately nobody at the time bothered to take and put them on a, on a no re-enter Brazil list. They just were chucked out and disappeared. Move on a year and they're back but they know that they, they could be recognized so another guy is involved 
who pretends he works for National Geographic and wants to do a story on Ron. He wines and dines Ron and then comes up with a story that his wife's about to join them in, in Rio. Uh, Ron agrees to meet them again and they agree to meet at a restaurant underneath Sugarloaf because there's going to be a show up Sugarloaf that Ron was going to take them to. Um, what he didn't realize was the whole kidnappers were back in and this time they just worked out they were going to grab him. So Ron was at first lucky because he turned up at the restaurant exactly the time two tourist buses turned up. So they hoped they were just going to grab him and throw him into their combi van roadside. But Ron managed to go in with the tourist some of who recognized him and wanted autographs and things because Ron was waiting for some people who was going to meet this journalist. He took a table by the door, which was a big mistake. And he was sitting there and two of the gang that he hadn't been there previously, so he didn't recognize came in and grabbed him around the throat and manhandled him out into the road where the other kidnappers quickly grabbed him and threw him in the van. van. And John Miller, the main uh, kidnapper, was there. And it's like, nice to see you again, Ronnie. Uh, they told him that they'd kidnapped his son, Mike. And if he didn't um, go along with what they said, they would kill Mike. Uh, so there was not a lot Ronnie could do at that stage. He had to go along to see how he could get out of the situation. Um, they tied him up and they put him in an almost body bag, which they then put stickers on saying live snakes. And they went to the Santos Dumont airport in the center of Rio where they'd hired a plane which was standing by and they had to they had to file flight plans and kept moving around if they didn't get him in time. The pilot, I mean, only a Brazilian pilot would happily let you throw a bag with live snakes in the back of the plane, not even in the cargo area, but in the back of a small plane which then flew with these people. It was nighttime, it was already up to about 10 o'clock, I think, and they had to get out of there before the airport closed. They then flew up from, from Rio de Janeiro to Belém, um, and they, they had to, they arrived in, it, sort of around midnight or something, or later in Belém, where they had this incredible thing of having to find some taxis, again, throwing a bag, saying live snakes in the back of a taxi and telling the taxi driver, don't worry about it. And they went down to the yacht club, some of them had come in, they'd rented a, a, a boat in um, up in the Caribbean from Miami, which they'd sailed down. The poor captain and the, the cook on board didn't know what these guys were up to. In fact, the cook did jump ship in Belém. She realised there was something very odd about these people. So she stayed on. Anyway, they managed to throw Ron over the gate of the yacht club and put him on a dinghy and row him out to the boat, still telling them they got Mike and he was if he didn't cooperate, he would be killed. Uh, Miller and one of the others then left the boat and Ron was left on that sailing yacht, the now Can I, Can I 2, which then sailed from Belém and was meant to be going. It was actually meant to be going up to St. Lucia, um, but en route. And there was nothing Ron could do. There was no point making a fuss about it. He might as well enjoy the, the voyage as he thought, well, you know, these guys are dangerous as well. They were all ex-Scots guards, which is another story I won't bother, bore you with at all. But um, on the way, the the the, the Boat sprung a leak uh, and nearly sank, which Ron thought, well, that's good if I'm going down there coming with me. Um, and he didn't care. And they were close to Barbados. So they did an SOS to Barbados, the, 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 the vessel. At this stage, and I should, sorry, one of the things I should explain was that we knew in Rio the story was Ron had been kidnapped, but the authorities thought it was a publicity stunt because Ron was very good at publicity stunts. And he had something that we had a book that was going to be coming out or something about him at that time. And the Brazilian said, we'll only take it seriously when he doesn't turn up to sign in, which was exactly a week away. So for the first week, and I remember in Rio, we were all, well, has he been kidnapped or is he just hiding somewhere? So none of us took it seriously. And it wasn't until the world discovered that Ronnie Biggs was on this boat now sinking off Barbados, that the world had discovered where Ronnie Biggs had got to. Um, so Ron was Ron was still convinced the boat was going to sink. And you'll look in the photos where you see the, gold, the, the golden lion where he's staggering a bit. He admits to me he went into the cabin and he just drank everything they had. And he said it was an awful mix of Grand Marnier, Tia Maria, rum. So he said when he landed on in Barbados, he was absolutely out of his tree and has no recollection of it at all. He had the most appalling hangover for about two days and could hardly speak to anybody. So there he gets to Barbados, where everyone's now convinced being the British Isle, you know, it's links to Britain. It's really easy. They will just extradite him straight back to um, mm -hmm. uh, to Britain. Um, as it happened, a lawyer, which by all, I mean, what are the chances? He was a Barbadian who happened to be serving for a barrister in London at the time of the great train robbery trial and actually worked on the great train robbery trial. So he walked into Ron's thing and says, I'll get you off. I know how to do it. And that man went on to be the chief justice of Barbados. So he's, he's done all right in his life.
And they found that there were some anomal anomalies. The first one was nobody stamped Ron in when he arrived in Barbados. So it's just one of those beautiful legal things. You don't exist. If nobody stamped you in, you don't exist and you can't backdate a stamp. So he didn't exist. Then they discovered that the Queen hadn't signed a particular agreement with Barbados so that the, one of the laws they were doing actually had never come into existence. So much to everybody's surprise. Um, Ron, at the first hearing, they were going to send him back on appeal. It was granted that no, he should be freed because there was no case. In the middle of this, his young son, Mike Seven, was going on television. Very clever friend of mine, John Pixton, who acted as his uncle um, and was looking after him with his wife, put him on television, basically saying, I want my daddy back. And one of the people watching it uh, when he was on television doing this was the chief of the Minister of Justice from Brazil, whose wife started battering around the head saying, what are you doing for this poor boy and his father? And the chief justice thought he better do something. So that's when the Brazilian government started saying, you cannot come to Brazil and start kidnapping people. And they started doing the argument, get Ron back. And that was an agreement. I don't know if there was stuff behind the scenes that also the British realized it didn't look good if Britain was gonna stand by people kidnapping people off the streets of other countries. The interesting footnote to that was all the kidnappers were allowed to leave Barbados. No charges were ever put against them. And they've never been charged for kidnapping Ron. They just went their own ways. Um, the only thing which Ron really appreciated later on was one of the kidnappers did try to go on holiday to Barbados with his wife years later. I mean, literally decades later, and he was still on a no entry list. So he arrived in Barbados and was sent straight back to London. And that Ron really appreciated. His return to Brazil was paid for by the ITV and Brazil's Globo. They had a plane because uh, they decided there's no way they could get him from the Caribbean back to Brazil without passing through other territories. So a plane was organized and he was flown back and that's Ron doing the Pope thing of kissing the ground when he got back to Belém because they were only willing to pay for the plane to get back to the nearest part of Brazil. And then he did a commercial flight down to Rio where there was a huge, I mean, all the world's press was at Rio airport to see Ron reunited with his son, Mike. Um, now it wasn't only the justice minister's wife who had seen Mike singing, the head of CBS records had seen Mike singing and thought he had a lot of charm for the cameras. And they put him in, they contacted Ron on his return and they asked if Mike would like to join a new kids group called uh, the Automa de Balon Magico, so the Magic Balloon Gang. And Mike did join them. It was another boy, Toby, and a, and a girl, Simone. And they started recording records. Uh, they were then given a daily TV show by TV Globo. And they're still to this day, one of the 20th biggest selling groups in Brazilian history of music. And again, that's a myth about Ron. Ron wasn't living in Brazil off the money from the great train robbery that had gone a long time ago. He was actually living off the success of his son selling millions of records. And that's what paid for his apartment and everything like that. Unfortunately, the press doesn't often do that. We then should have come to a bit of a fun time. You know, lots of people were visiting Ron at that time. I never knew who I'd bump into him in his house. It was it was crazy. Uh, the top one, that's Yuri Geller and his son visiting Ron. And I remember he wanted to do a thing. He kept telling me that couldn't we find he wanted to find a, a big train in America that he'd make disappear and it would all be linked to Ron and it would be another great train robbery. And we passed on that one. It seemed a bit strange. That's him at the Grand Prix. Uh, the one where he's wearing the policeman hat, he, he's with... Um, uh, the Happy Mondays, who were there for a show. And the great the great story behind that photo is just off the photo is Piers Morgan, who was then a young reporter for The Mirror, I think it was at the time. He was their um, uh, entertainment correspondent. He'd gone out to cover Rock in Rio. And years later, um, I, I was talking to Piers Morgan, who wanted to have Ron go on his life that those doctor those programs he has on ITV when he looks at somebody's life and we were trying to put it together and he said please do tell Ron that I've been to his house he won't remember me he said I was just the very nervous journalist who was with the happy Mondays at the back there and uh, so there are some photos of, of of Piers Morgan in the house with the happy Mondays uh, there's uh, Gus Dudgeon, Die Totenhosen were a German gang, a, a very popular German group, and he recorded several hit records with them. Uh, Bobby Moore is the man leaning against the goalposts. He turned up and uh, Ron met with him. Most people who turn up would like to meet with him, including, you know, he, they wanted him to do the royal family uh, when they were there and he refused. Um, 
this is just we eventually uh, my, my relationship with Ron is we then decided I mean I just just knew him and in Rio we were always meeting um, and then we'd be having lunch or whatever and I always said to him when you're ready to tell your full story let me know and we, we'll, we'll we'll write your your proper biography with all the facts in it and and that's what we did so that would be where are we up to now 94 we published that um uh, and that was the definitive uh biography except except Charmian had a few things she she decided she got a different version of so we we would discuss them and they were all corrected when we did the next one um uh, so that's Jack Slipper with actually Mike Biggs they Mike was sent over to London obviously Ron couldn't come to the launch of it and we did a a satellite press conference at the Groucho Club uh we were in a small studio in Rio with the Brazilian press doing that um Ron heavily involved with Samba and, and stuff in, in Rio. Um, and one year he was honored by one of the one of the Samba schools. He was part of their theme. Um, and strangely, at this stage, I had now moved up to, I was working in Los Angeles. And Ron was telling me about it. And I said to Ron, I said, the theme of it's not really great because it was another time when um, uh, the, the 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 British authorities were trying to get Ron extradited again, and the theme of that Samba school were basically that all politicians were crooks and everything. And Ron, Ron was had would have had this entire float as him, and he was going to appear on it. And I actually said did say to Ron, I really would have second thoughts about that, mate, because if you upset them, that could be it. And he did. He he apologised to the school and said he really thinks he better set this sit this one out. And they got an actor to play him instead. But he is he is one of the very few living um, foreigners that have ever been honoured in the main Samba School Parade. Um, a few foreigners have, who have died, like Margaret Mee, she was honoured by Beja Flor. Um, but mainly they have Brazilians who are alive. A lot of the musicians get covered, but not um, uh, uh, in the case of Ron, he did that. And then we came that, you know, he, his health was 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 deteriorating um, and he didn't have the money anymore coming in to pay for the health. And it, it, if the authorities here had only read bothered to read the first autobiography in it, Ron had said, well, when I'm a driveling old mess and I need looking after, I'll simply get on a plane and go back to Britain because they'll be quite happy to arrest me. And it stuck in his mind and he decided he was just he was ruining his son's life because of his illness. He even almost committed suicide and was saved by his son. So eventually he made the decision that he would come back to Britain. Um, and I was involved with all that, bringing him back. And um, he was quite convinced that the ego of the authorities would not stop him coming back again. If they'd looked at it properly they would have just said no thanks stay in brazil that's where you made your life just stay there but they didn't they were so eager to get him so a deal was struck by the sun newspaper um and it was all hush hush and then somebody somebody got wind that somebody might know about it so we had to bring the bringing him back a very rushed job um and i just by coincidence i happened to be already scheduled to go out to brazil for a travel event so i knew i was traveling out i was at that time running the brazilian tourist office in london i was based in the embassy and i always used to tell the ambassadors my links so they wouldn't get embarrassed i said you do not want to be at a cocktail party and be told your head of tourism is actually ron's ghost and they always were very good about it and very charming about the whole thing um and on this case of him coming back, the ambassador just said to me, please, Chris, tell me you're not speaking to Ron over the embassy phones. And I said, no, it's on my mobile. He said, that's fine. Good luck. See what you can do. So anyway, I flew out and took him the papers, which was the coverage. Um, the naivety of the sun is that they thought that they, they knew that Ron's house, which only had a stairway up, was being surrounded by the, the press. So they needed to hide him. They just thought they could hide him in a hotel in Rio. And we had to try and explain to him that that, that wouldn't work. Whatever hotel you had in Rio would be under siege. Um, so we got him a safe house out in Barra and we took him out there for a couple of days. And then the jet was again paid for by, uh, first people thought it was Rupert Murdoch's own private jet, but it's actually a, a twin of his private jet, which was hard to fly down and take Bruce Reynolds um, and his son, Nick, down to fly back with them because Bruce said, I got him into this. I should get him out of this. It's, it was an honor thing that Bruce flew down with Nick. We had this crazy thing on the day he was leaving where we ended up at uh, Rio Airport in a van surrounded by the mass press. And luckily I know Rio Airport very well. So I told them where to drive around so that we could get him out safely. And we smuggled him through. And a very touching thing was the uh, Brazilian federal police took Ron away from 
the Sun reporters and Mike and everybody and just put him in a room and they said, please tell us you're doing this of your free will. Has anybody kidnapped anybody? Have you been threatened? They just wanted to know, you know, that he, he did want to come back and, and they, they, they left it with saying, you'll be welcome back anytime when you want to come back. And then he flew back and of course he was taken and put in Belmarsh for about 10 years, which seemed ridiculous. Then he was moved to Nor Norwich and then we got him out. I could tell you so much more, but I know I've gone way over my time, Ed. So I better, better stop there, I think. Well, yeah, and I know, I know we've gone on a long time, but there's so much to tell, isn't there? I, I, I think, um, well, they'll just have to read your book, which <laughs> luckily I see is still available. <laughs> <laughs> and I did put a link to it in the, in the, in the chat. Um, no, that's absolutely fascinating, uh, Chris. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Um, and um, I thought your comment about lockdown men menus was particularly appropriate to, <laughs> to our time at the moment. It's um, crazy, isn't it? <laughs> unusually, I'm not. I'm not going to take any questions. I'm just going to. I'm just going to thank you. It, it was absolutely fascinating. Um, anyone who who did have any questions, who would like to ask them, just send them to me and I'll send them on to Chris, who obviously I can tell just knows everything. <laughs> <that I know. laughs> But if I told you everything, I'd have to come round and kill you all, so I won't. Well, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so all I will very quickly uh, tell you is that uh, next time, um, um, Ben Box, on the 27th of April, uh, Ben was listening today, um, who um, is, is an amazing guy. What he doesn't know about Latin America, I'm sure Chris will agree. Uh, he has yeah. edited the South American Handbook for 30 plus years. Um, I've asked him to just pick an area of Latin America and talk about it, and he has chosen off the beaten track Bolivia to tell us about. Um, and it has links to uh, geology, uh, dinosaurs, and wine. So I'll send an email out about that. Um, and then on the 18th of May, uh, we're going to continue the wine theme uh, with Amanda Barnes, who uh, uh, what she doesn't know about Argentine wine isn't worth knowing. She's going to, uh, I'm trying to work out whether we can incorporate some sort of tasting element. We'll see how we get on. <laughs> um, but probably towards the end of this week, uh, I'll send out an email about that and get the recording of this talk put up on our website um, because actually tomorrow I've got to go and have my, my shoulder operated on. Um, managed to get a slot, so I thought I should take it up. <laughs> Um, but Chris, again, thank you very, very much. And uh, do feel yeah. free to uh, uh, unmute yourselves and show your appreciation. Yeah. Thank you very much. A pleasure. <laughs> and do, do send your questions. I'll happily answer any of them that I couldn't get through. So I apologise for taking up so much of your time when you could have been in beer gardens or shopping or something like that. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was riveting. Thank you. Thank you very much.